Now I'm going to turn things back to Pear to introduce our first speaker. And the first speaker in the last session today is uh, Christian Torborg. He's from our institution in Copenhagen. You've met him a couple of times before. And he will uh, try to cover the exercise-based treatment. Christian. Thank you very much, Pear. It's working. Can you hear me? Okay, so thank you again for inviting me to speak in this session and uh, as Pierre said, I'm going to cover exercise-based treatment and uh, I think when we talk about uh, exercise-based uh, or evidence for any kind of treatment, we, we really want to not only cover the clinical evidence but also have an explanation or theoretical rationale for for the effects of, of what we're really doing. So it's not enough just to say that it's working. We also need to understand why it's working. Unfortunately, I think this is probably sports medicine, uh, where you, a lot of the times, you will actually have the clinical evidence, uh, and then afterwards you will have to try to figure out what is actually the rationale for this treatment that is, that is working or seems to be working. So it's sort of putting the cart before the horse, and uh, actually that's, I think, what Pierre did when he did his uh, Lancet study because his um, idea of treatment was based on empirical evidence, meaning that he saw that this program was actually working in the real world um, and uh, he put that to the ultimate test by doing an RCT, but he didn't really have any theoretical rationale at the moment exactly for why it's working. So I'm going to speak a little bit about both sides of this coin and try to see if, and if we can go through this. So already before Pierre did, did this study, we, we had actually quite a few um, Dutch studies um, where they looked at the biomechanics of the pelvic ring, and we also have some older drawings um, showing how the, force uh, how the force is distributed through the pelvic ring and also to the pu pubic symphysis when you're walking and running. And uh, this idea or model was also um, confirmed in this finite element model from Delstra and Hoskis, where they actually showed that if you then also take into account uh, the muscle forces working on that pelvic ring, and now you have to look closely to the right, that this is when the muscle forces are acting on the pelvic ring, but if they are sort of taken out of the equation, then the forces really change this, uh, to a different side uh, at the pelvic ring. So again, you have a theoretical uh, idea that muscles actually do have a, a, a contribution to how forces are distributed through the pelvic ring. And that's also given, been shown in other uh, basic science studies from the Netherlands where they've showed also that it, the adductors also seem to work from, sort of speak, from the leg and then up to the pelvic, sort of trying to stabilize uh, the pelvic uh, muscles and the pelvic ring. Uh, from the femur when the foot is on the ground. Um, and we have sort of an anterior system with the abdominals and the adductors, but we also have a posterior system where you have the glutes and the um, latissimus dorsi. And you could talk about a medial to lateral system where you have the gluteus medius and the adductors. Um, so these are sort of some theories on how you can stabilize that uh, pubic symphysis and that pelvic ring. If you then go to some of the specific sports, and this is uh, Tim Tyler's sports that he's been talking about. This is the ice hockey, and if you look at some of the studies that they made in ice hockey, this is a nice study from Chang et al. Then you can see that actually uh, where the muscles are working the most, especially the, uh, the gluteus maximus, which is working to push out uh, the leg, then the adductor magnus sort of has to, um, or the adductors in general sort of have to to uh, work eccentrically uh, on the way. And what you can see is that, that it's that transition phase where you actually go from eccentric to concentric, and that's what those lines uh, sh are showing here. I think it's that. So this is the transition phase going from eccentric to concentric, and that's where the muscles really have to, to increase uh, their workload. And uh, what this study also showed that uh, if you increase your skating speed, you actually do that by increasing your stride rate. 
and that will increase the abduction at auction angular velocity, which are then will create more muscle activity, which you can see here uh, in relation to, the, um, to how fast you're actually skating. So if you're skating at a slower pace, it's here, faster and faster, and much more EMG activity will, will be um, accompanying this uh, movement. And again, that relates to the study by Tyler. We've already seen this, but also that you could actually relate this eccentric adduction to abduction ratio. And if that becomes too low, you actually have increased risk. So again, there is some theoretical underpinning why you might get an injury and also what you could do in terms of trying to address that. Then in soccer, we've also seen this slide before. And here, the, um, one of the main mechanisms, which was actually quite nicely shown in, in also Ernest Schilder's talk, where you saw the, the, the goalkeepers kicking the ball, that one of the mechanisms of injury is actually in the backswing. So again, it's in that eccentric phase just before you have to uh, turn the, to the movement around and come forward again. And that's where you have your peak adductor longus activation. And it's also where you have your maximum adductor longus rate of stretch. And those two together, uh, would really set you up for a possible uh, muscle tenderness injury in your doctor longus. And again, if you relate that to some of the risk factor studies, again, we've seen this data before that if you then have decreased adductor strength, even though this is a very crude measure in this study, that's actually the main risk factor for getting a future groin injury. So, Again, addressing this, I've shown you this already, but again, in this assessor blinded study we did, we can show that this 20% uh, reduction is also in the eccentric uh, hip strength, uh, adduction strength, uh, where it's, it's not really there when we do the isometric testing. So again, that just builds up to this uh, deficit that these players even have before or might also have as a consequence of injury. But what about the abdominals? Uh, they also seem to be in a lot of stretch, uh, especially during kicking. Uh, and uh, again, you can see that on the picture here, that that whole, uh, uh, from that shoulder to that leg is really getting a lot of stretch through that oblique. And also the other one, which has to contract through kicking as well. So there's a lot of stretch going on through the, from the adductor to the abdominals. And also, it's been quite a lot of research, not so much in, in the sports population, but from the Australians looking at other muscle groups and synergies, uh, especially here we see the transversal abdominals, but also with the pelvic floor in the bottom and the diaphragm in the top. And you can say that within that uh, sort of core, there you also have the psoas muscles and the quadratus lumborum. So there's a, there's a lot of muscles there which also provide uh, stability and force production when we move in sports. Um, if we then go to some of the studies who's actually looked at uh, different aspects of trunk function, this was also the study that Andrea Mosler referred to. And here they had uh, uh, athletes uh, without groin pain compared to athletes with groin pain uh, in a study where they were lifting the leg. And what they really saw from that study was that the, the transversus abdominis had a delayed onset when compared to the rectus femoris. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is, again, if, if you look on the right, uh, that the transversus abdominis here comes in around uh, 10 milliseconds before the rectus femoris in those without groin pain. And if you then change that, uh, that was sort of the main pattern that saw that the transversus abdominis was sort of too late uh, in, re in relation to the rectus femoris. But what you have to remember is that this study, they actually showed that what we're talking about is milliseconds. So this is around 10 milliseconds later. And uh, so I think what you can really discuss here is what's the clinical application of being 10 milliseconds uh, too late. And uh, I usually compare it with this just to get you an idea of what 10 milliseconds is. And that's the amount of time it takes a hummingbird to flap its wings once. So it's, it's really not a lot. Uh, and I think we have to consider also when we look at this study, the effect size between controls and those with pain. Because if you remember Andrea Mosler's talk, she was talking about effect size. And from what I can deduct of these data, the effect sizes are so really minimal or small. And you have a lot of variation in this. So it's not, it's not a really um, discriminating factor. And it's not the effect size is very small. If you look at this kind of testing, though, where you are actually looking at concentric and eccentric testing of the abdominals, this study actually found, again, no deficit in the concentric phase, but again, a huge deficit in the uh, eccentric phase. 
And again, if you look, if you compare that from an effect size point of view, there's actually a large effect size here. So here we're actually uh, near an effect size uh, around three. That's a huge effect size. Again, so I, I would just put out uh, a bit of a provocation saying, as, as, what's the sort of, what's the rationale for drawing in your navel in an exercise if you have a 37% deficit? I mean, I would probably address that with, with strength training uh, first on, and then especially eccentric components. Uh, I mean, to be fair, at this time they didn't have these data, but it's, I, I think we just have to get these things into perspective. And then also looking at, because these are very simplistic uh, strength um, measurements that we're doing, but actually when we move, we can see if you just have a look at these three guys, they, do, they would be cutting in, in, in different ways. So this guy... Uh, who's, who's trying to change direction here uh, in terms of the guy playing with the ball, he would probably be in internal rotation. But I would disagree. Those of you who said, saw Jeffrey Wells' talk where he was actually turning his upper body this way, that would actually be not internal rotation but relative external rotation. So again, that actually fits very nicely with the data from Rinch's uh, talk where you're actually talking about being in flexion and in external rotation can create that extra bone that can cause you trouble when you then, in an offloaded position, put the leg into internal rotation. I think we really have to understand these uh, mechanisms also when we are trying to make exercise-based treatments. And again, just to show you how many possibilities there are around the pelvic that you can, that you can actually turn. So this is the movement that I'm talking about. See if we can get that. So this is the relative external rotation where the, where the trunk is actually internal rotating with the pelvic. And very nice study from, from Australia. It doesn't get mentioned a lot, but Donna O'Connor actually made a prediction model where they could correctly classify 92% of non-injured players and 90% or 91% of injured players. And, but you have to consider that, that the model that they then exploratorily included uh, were including all these um, aspects. So not just one strength measure, but abduction, peak torque, abduction with rotation, peak torque, angle of abduction with rotation peak talk and so forth. So actually, if you put a lot of these things into the same basket and make the analysis, they, they all mean something and they probably get a better estimate. This we cannot do in the clinic. It's just to show that there are a lot of measurements that actually can explain this if we put them t uh, together in a, in a more uh, sophisticated anal analysis. So this is the program that I will talk about in this, uh, in this talk. Uh, this is the Peer Helmick program, and I will mainly go through two studies. So the, the study that Peer did and also the study that Adam did, because they used this kind of program. And I'm not sure at that time Peer would be able to explain why. He, uh, I mean, I think they had a theoretical idea of what they wanted to cover with these exercises. But, I mean, basically, they also saw that this kind of approach where they would progressively increase the load from what they thought was a progressive increase really was beneficial for these players when applied over a longer period of time. So these are the two studies who has actually used this program. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about those. And if you remember Robert Jan's talk as, as well uh, earlier, these, these are two of the studies uh, that actually had high quality. Uh, in his systematic review, uh, so I, I think I'll just base it on that because there's, a, of course, there's other uh, studies on exercise treatments. And just to give you the basics of this kind of treatment program, you suddenly have, or you, you certainly have sort of an, an, uh, an introduction where you're, you're sort of trying to isolate the structures and also you go into a coordination phase and then you go into a sport specific phase. And the idea is that, that you go from low load to, and then just increase the load in more sophisticated movements. Other important aspects is that you do a lot of repetitions. It's actually three times a week, one and a half hour duration. So it, it's actually quite important that it's supervised and you do the amount of work that you have to do. Uh, you shouldn't have pain provocation or exacerbating uh, activities, and running is not allowed until six weeks. And then you can see here, they usually have ret uh, return to sport within four months, but I will also show you when you actually have your clinical outcome in those studies in relation to these exercises. And again, I'll just, if anyone is going to do any kind of exercise-based treatment, I would really urge you to read this article because one of the things I think we have not described sufficiently in the literature, which is actually done already by Pierre in his 99 study, is 
stuff like the load magnitude, the number of repetitions, the rest in between sets and so on, because if we don't describe these strength training descriptors, how can we make sure that we're actually doing the same in, in studies saying using similar programs? So this, this is Adam's um, uh, result first. So he looked at, at his um, cohort at four months, and they had 50% good and excellent results. And then he followed them up at two years and had 47% excellent results. And uh, if you then plot in Pierre's result, he looked at his with the good and excellent at seven months, and he had 74% and 88% uh, after eight to 12 years. And I think I'm not going to stand here and say which, uh, because these uh, results differ, and it might be the explanation that Adam gave that it may be the compliance. We know from studies at the moment that there's a, we just did a hamstring study where we have very high compliance, but if you have no compliance, that was just shown in the systematic review by, um, where Mike Ryman was actually involved, that if you don't do your exercise, surprisingly, you're not going to have the effect. And that could be a, a possible explanation here as well. Um, I just want to allude uh, to you this slide because I thought that was quite interesting. This was the clinical paper that actually won in, 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 the, in this tendon congress a few uh, months ago. And what they did here was they used isometric contractions where they had 70% of M, uh, maximum volume isometric contraction from Ebony Rio. And they did it for 45 seconds uh, and repeated it five times. I had two minutes rest. And that actually uh, had a really good effect on the pain just immediately post, but also 45 minutes. This is only on six patients. Uh, and I'm just going to skip a little bit. Um, but the main thing here is that this kind of, of exercise treatment actually has a very dramatic uh, effect on the motor system and especially on the neural inhibition. Uh, and that's what uh, Ebony Rio showed. And then if you go back to Pierre's exercises, look what he did. Um, each adduction was 30 seconds and it was 10 repetitions. It's actually very similar to what Ebony Rio has been doing. So. I'm not, I don't think that Ebony Rio has provided a very new approach, but it might be uh, just going back to that uh, way of addressing isometrics, which is a really helpful also just for reducing the pain. Again, the same here in this position. And we have shown by using EMG that we actually get very similar EMG activity and healthy, uh, and you get up to around 80 to 100% when they can squeeze as hard as they can with the ball here. Uh, and we've also shown that you probably need to move on to those exercises to become more dynamic. And again, we've shown that this kind of exercise, you can bring that up and you can, can uh, get rid of some of that uh, inhibition that you have in these muscles. Uh, and that you can, by using these kind of programs where you progressively load people up, that that has a really good effect on that deficit that we've seen with the soccer players. So you actually get an eccentric strength gain as well. This is in healthy controls, but it's just to try to underpin the treatment given to this uh, patient group. So I think we're trying to sort of now uh, uh, reverse this. And also, it's important to go back and try to understand why is something working so we can build upon that and probably even improve it further. So I think my main message is that exercise-based treatment at the moment should be first uh, treatment choice uh, for long-standing groin pain. This is only related to the adductor-related groin pain. Uh, and that you could say you have 50 to 70% good or excellent result within the first year, but you could also say that you have 25 to 50% of fair to poor results uh, within the first year. And if you have, uh, and if your patients are fair to poor, what do you do then? And I think some of the next speakers will address that. Thank you very much.